undaunted faith. Uh, it means to be not intimidated by difficulty, danger, or disappointment. And those are some very real things that we need because life, a life of faith is sometimes difficult. We can be intimidated by the world or by uh, a lot of things, actually. We can be self-intimidated. Uh, but difficulty can cause us to want to turn around and quit, to, to question our calling and what God wants us to do. Certainly danger and disappointment when things don't go the way we think they should or the way we expect. Uh, it can cause us to uh, want to turn around. But Nehemiah was a man who was undaunted in his faith. And we can learn a lot from reading and studying the book of Nehemiah. I guess it is um, at least in terms of preaching and, well, just in terms of reading. I read Nehemiah often. Uh, it encourages me and strengthens me in one of my favorite books. Uh, and so today we come to Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm trying to take it a chapter at a time. Uh, it's hard because uh, you get into this chapter and there is a lot of stuff to, to talk about. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to try to just cover the, the chapter today. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4, he, uh, he is leading the people of God to reveal the broken down walls of honor and protection and security in their lives. And yet, that is so relevant to today that people need to restore and build back up the walls of honor. Honor has lost its value in our American culture, at least, and I think worldwide. And we see, we see this in the politicians. That's probably the most prevalent place we see it because we're in, in, impacted with it by the news all the time and with the election and all. Where's the honor? In a person's life and then the protection for their lives and for their families and security and so of course for uh, the people of Jerusalem and, and uh, Judah uh, protection those walls were a primary protection but they also did represent honor and security and when you and I began to seek God to build up the walls of honor and godliness in our lives we will soon find ourselves in a battle uh, with the believer's mortal enemy. His name is Satan. Amen? Amen? He will use everything in his arsenal to stop what God says must be done in our lives. Uh, and so today I'm preaching on the subject that enemy attacks. And I think this is a very relevant study. Before reading our scripture today, I want to say just a couple of things. First of all, Satan is a defeated foe. Amen. His bark is worse than his bite. He uh, can frighten us and cause us to tremble, but he is subject to our God. And he cannot do any more in our lives than we allow him to and what God will allow him to. And uh, we don't have time to fully develop that thought, but he is defeated. And so we must remember that when he attacks because he can, can greatly intimidate us and discourage us oh, yeah. and cause us to want to quit. As God's people, we are not ignorant to his devices, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper, according to Isaiah chapter 54, 17. So we are indeed more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. And we can indeed do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We do not have to cower behind the walls of a church or behind the walls of our faith because we are overcomers, according to Romans 8, 37. We can overcome through uh, Christ. And the Bible reminds us in the book of Revelation that the saints overcame him, that being Satan, the uh, Lucifer, uh, by the word of the Lamb, uh, by the blood of the Lamb, I'm sorry, and the word of their testimony. And so we are not, uh, the task is not too big for us to rebuild the walls in our lives and to build godliness into us. 
It's not more than we can do. It's not more than we're able to do because we have a living power living in us. Those of us that are believers, Christ lives in us. And he is able to do abundantly uh, more than we can ever ask or think. It's according to the power that's working in you. When I was first saved, we sang a song in the choir of Olivia. And the name of that song was According to the Power. And I used to love that song. and not heard it since those days. But uh, in spite of all that, we must remember uh, that, as we'll see in our scripture today, that our battle is not with men. Sometimes we think so-and-so is opposing us, or so-and-so is the problem. But our battle is not with men, but it's with unseen powers working in uh, working through men whose spirits are unyielded to Christ. Now I worded that very carefully because uh, believers and uh, like unbelievers can be unyielded at times to Christ. Mm -hmm. Unbelievers certainly are, but believers, I recall to your mind that Jesus said to Satan, get thee behind me. He said, you're wrong, Peter, but I understand it's not you, it's Satan who is working behind you. And so we must yield our lives to Christ fully and completely, and it's only then that we can live a totally uh, victorious and joyful lifestyle. I don't know about you, but I want to build up those walls, and that's the life I want to live. And so let's read today, Nehemiah chapter 4, and I believe I put verses 1 through 14 in the in overheads, and we'll make references to the other. The Bible says, and so it happened when Sanballat, you remember he's the one who was upset when Nehemiah came in Nehemiah chapter 2, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant. What a word, he was indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the armies of Samaria. You notice these are uh, enemies, so to speak. And he said, what are these people Jews doing? Uh, as much as he was saying it before his enemies, he was also saying it before the enemies. Uh, it implies something that he didn't just say one time, but he said over and over. He It became his... Uh, his platform, so to speak, that he shared everywhere he went, sort of like our uh, uh, candidates for office do. And so he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria. Remember, he was not a Jew. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete in a day? Uh, will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. Now Tobiah, that's his counterpart, the Ammonite, was beside him and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break it down their stone wall. Hmm. Hear, O oh our God, Nehemiah said, for we are despised. Turn their reproach upon their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity, and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Amen. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. Again, we see this word angry. And it says, and all of them conspired together. When it says all of them, it talks about those four forces that were mentioned. And uh, really, in reality, those four forces represent enemies to the north, enemies to the east, enemies to the west, and enemies to the south. So they, they were surrounded by enemies. And so they all came together against Jerusalem, sort of like what's going to happen 
uh, in the end times, all the nations are going to come against the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they conspire together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. You ought to underline that, create confusion, because Satan always wants to create confusion among God's people. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Again, we see him praying. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build a wall. This is the Jews speaking now. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. Notice how intimidating the language is. And so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us a couple of times. How many times? Ten times. Nehemiah, he had to be a detailed leader because he kept right. Ten times they told us from wherever uh, place you turn, they will be upon us. He was hearing it everywhere he went. Even from his own people. He says, Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So Nehemiah called them to be courageous and fight and stand their ground and protect, the, in fact, the, the uh, wall, portion of the walls nearest to them for their families, for their brethren, for their children, and uh, so on. And so uh, they faced opposition here. And uh, so I want you to notice that when things are going well, just get ready. Because that's when the enemy doesn't want to see the work of God make progress. Mm -hmm. As long as the people in Jerusalem were content with those burned down walls and those burned gates and living there in disarray, the enemy left them alone. Sometimes we wonder why the wicked prosper. Because he's not bothering them. He doesn't, he doesn't try to attack them because they're content with where they're at. But when you begin to do God's work, God's way, and for you and for your, your family and your heritage, uh, then that's when Satan really gets upset. And uh, so they begin to serve God and bring glory to his name and the enemy became active. And so we see the, the opposition that they Face. Now I want to say opposition is not only an evidence that God is blessing, but it's also an opportunity for us to grow. Because when opposition comes against us, our faith can be strengthened. It's just the same as if you've ever done anything with weights or, or uh, even in work. The more you work that muscle, the bigger it grows. And sometimes you've got to uh, we had a saying back in my day, I guess it's still around, uh, that there's no gain without pain. You've got to work that muscle and you can make progress. And so when opposition comes, it's an opportunity that you're going to be able to grow in your faith. You're going to handle this situation the way God would have you to. And as a result, you'll grow in wisdom, you'll grow in spirituality, and you'll grow in uh, all other facets of your life. And so we see that this opposition was bedded in anger. Now, Satan is an angry person. He's not a person, he's a being. Satan is an angry being because he knows he's already defeated. You see, the only reason he messes with you and I is because we remind him of his defeat at the cross. Because Christ is living in us it's not you that he hates. It's the Jesus in you. It's not what you're doing. It's what God is doing in you. It's not the task that you've set out to follow, but it's what God has called you to do. 
And that's what Satan hates more than anything because Satan hates God. And so you've got to recognize the, the, the enemy here. And so often, this is where believers fail. We fail to recognize the true enemy. We, we think that so-and-so, and this person, that person, those people aren't the enemies. True. They're just like Peter. They're, they're trying to do what they think is right. The enemy is Satan. And so he comes with anger. Uh, I'll point out to you that in verse 1 it says he was, that they were furious, they were very indignant, and they mocked and made fun of. Verse 7, it says they were very angry. And so we see here the anger uh, in the opposition. I can't remember how I worded it on over it. Scott, thank you. Angry questions of ridicule. Nehemiah asked uh, several questions here uh, to ridicule them and to uh, make his point and to try to discourage him. Now, I read a great quote, Thomas Carlyle, and I, I have no idea who Thomas Carlyle is, but he said this, ridicule is the language of the devil. When you ridicule someone, you're speaking the devil's language. See, Satan works in the shadows of our minds. He wants to twist God's truth to cause us to doubt and to fail. I call to your remembrance, Genesis chapter 3. You remember there in that peaceful garden? Adam and Eve and all the animals and all the beautiful plants. It was a peaceful garden. And who showed up to mess things up? It was Satan. And Satan came and he said to Eve, Has God really said? Mm -hmm. And he began to question what God told Adam and Eve about the tree of good and evil. He began to, to twist and manipulate what uh, God said in Eve's mind so that she began to think that God was keeping something from them instead of giving something to them. You see, God is a giver. He's not keeping something from us. He's not uh, making it hard on us when he gives us opposition or allows opposition to come our way. God is blessing us because we're becoming more like him in the fight. That's when you grow. Someone said, I said it several weeks ago, the bumps are what you climb on in life. And so Satan ridiculed uh, the work that was being done. And, and he attacked in several areas. First of all, he attacked their morale. You know, when the morale is down, then no one thinks they can do anything. And I've seen this happen in churches time and time again. Sometimes a church that need a, a hellfire brimstone uh, revival, they need a revival of unity and morale. That we are God's people. And we're not as bad off as we thought we were. And God can take this situation and turn it around. And so Satan attacked the morale and he called them feeble Jews. He was... He was making them feel small. And that's what Satan does. He wants to make you feel small. He wants to make you feel insignificant. He wants to make you feel powerless. He wants to make you feel defeated. That there's no use going on. But I'll just stand up today and quote Jesus. And Jesus said he is a liar from the beginning. And there's no truth in him. Amen? And uh, greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. And it speaks of Satan and his world system when it says that. And so he, he attacks them around. He says, what are these feeble Jews doing? As if they're second-rate citizens in the kingdom of God. Friend, I want you to know we are not second-rate citizens in the kingdom of God. We may be in a, a, a small church as, uh, as some churches go, but as some churches go, we're in a large church. You see, sometimes he gets us looking at the wrong thing. <coughs> We are not second rate. We are not feeble. We are uh, able to do all that he asked us to do. And he is able to do exceedingly abundantly in us all that he wants to do. And so he attacks them around. Secondly, he attacks their motive. He says, will they fortify themselves? 
Now what he's implying here is that they're going to build their own little kingdom. That's what he's saying. Or you, you just want to build your own little kingdom and you're trying to get out from under the king of, of Persia. Uh, and and uh, remember that uh, Nehemiah had come under the authority of King Artaxerxes, the ruler, the most powerful ruler in the world at that time. And so he's implying that this is some sort of rebellion. You're, are you going to fortify yourselves? He's making fun of their motive. Next, next we see that Satan attacks our mission. He says, are you going to offer sacrifices? It's all in those questions. Uh, there's five questions there. Are you going to offer sacrifices? He's asking them and attacking their mission. You see, Nehemiah's mission was not only to rebuild the walls, but to see the honor and the glory of God restored there to the people of God. For them to begin to live according to what God had called them to do. And he's making fun of that. And, and he's questioning whether they will ever be able to do what God wants them to do. And then say, he not only attacks our morale, he attacks our motives, he attacks our mission, he attacks the methods that we use. He says, will you be able to complete it in a day? What he's, what he's saying is, why are you working so hard? You don't have to work so hard. Just slow down and take it easy, and, and we'll get it done someday, somehow. He's attacking the methods. But you see, Nehemiah understood the urgency of the call of God. And friend, I want you to know, God is urgently calling to every believer today because time is short and we must lift up the, the banner of Jesus in this world and we must strive for all that he would have us to do because the world settles for so much less. And if we'll settle for less, then that's the, all the world will see is what we can do. And the world needs to see so much more. And so he he attacks their method. And then finally, he attacks the very material. He says, uh, uh, all this rubbish that you're building on, it's useless. What you've got is nothing. You know what? People are going to come by, drive by here, and they can see a modular building, they'll say, or back when we was in the storefront building. But they're not a real church. They're not a real church. A real church would have a big brick building with steeple on it. Mm. Yeah. I want you to know, mm -hmm. Satan wants to attack the, the, what God has given you to use. When they were willing to take what God had and put, build it for his honor, and friend, I want to do the same thing. I want this building, as long as we're using it, to be the nicest building we could possibly make it. It should glorify and honor God and be used accordingly. And, and so he makes fun of the rubbish. He says, and by the way, if a fox jumps on it, it's going to fall down. He's, he's kind of uh, discarding the fact that they're building uh, with stones that have been used before. My friend, I don't know about you, but God has used second hand in my life a lot of times. Amen. In fact, uh, we read about it in the book of Acts where believers came together and they brought their goods and they had all things common. You see, they shared with one another. And that's what made that early church so strong. So it isn't our material that makes us weak. It's our unwillingness to share it. And if we'll take what we've got and we'll use it for His honor and His glory and for Him, then God will make it strong. Amen? And so you are able to do everything God wants you to do. But maybe you can't stand and preach a sermon but you can sing a beautiful song. Maybe you can't sing a beautiful song, but you can do something else. You can teach a wonderful yeah. lesson. Maybe you can't teach a wonderful lesson, but you can sit beside somebody and encourage them and put your arm around them and, and pray with them and strengthen them. It'll mean so much to the person around you. And so Satan attacks with angry questions. Have you, have you heard him up there in your mind before? Oh, yeah. I have. But then he attacks in another way. His anger uh, turns to conspiracy to confuse. You see, it was all about 
this conspiracy now when the when the forces came together and they wanted to confuse the, the people of God. They wanted to get them sidetracked on other things and cause them to lose focus on their work. They wanted to be, intimidate them so much that by looking around and they even said we're not able and caused them to be confused about their very purpose. And you know what, today I think there's a lot of Christians confused about their purpose in life. Yes. You see, my purpose in life is, is uh, to build this work here, but that's not my chief purpose. My chief purpose in life is to glorify God. My purpose in life in doing that is to encourage God's people, encourage people to know God. And so the church becomes uh, secondary to those other things in my life. Because God's gifted me and called me to preach, I believe he's given by spiritual gift is a gift of exhortation and encouragement. And uh, that doesn't mean I, I'm, not the, I'm not the greatest revival preacher. I'm not the, the kind of preacher that can, that, that can preach hellfire and brimstone and cause people to quake at the sound and the thought of it. That's not who I am. And that's not who God called me to be. God called me to be just exactly who I am. And so I need to understand my purpose is to glorify Him. And I'll best glorify Him when I'm doing what He called me to do in the way He called me to do it. And then I'll uh, choose to take those uh, purposes and play them out in my life. And in this case, it's working and growing the people of God in this church. And so there's a conspiracy here among the enemy to confuse the work of God by confusing the child of God. And that happens so often. We, we, we see somebody that's, that's failing and things that are happening in their life, and sometimes they'll just say, I'm confused. And there's some people that sometimes they, they, they're dead sure they know what they're supposed to do, but they're confused because of the way they're doing it. And so this conspiracy it resulted in three things in verse 10. I'll hurry along here. First of all, in verse 10, it said their strength was failing. It resulted in a loss of strength. If somebody continually tells you you're weak, you're weak, you're weak, you're weak, they began to feel strong or weak. They began to feel weak. You see, God's people don't need to be beat down. God's people need to be lifted up. God's a lifter of our heads. He's not, uh, he does not cause us to be downcast. He lifts us up. He sets us on a rock. He gives us a greater vantage point where we can see. He takes us out of the miry clay. And so they experienced a loss of strength. Their strength was failing. Also, we see in verse 10, where it mentions much rubbish, they experienced a loss of vision because this was how they were beginning to see themselves. Not only that they were weak, but they couldn't do what God wanted them to do. And oh, how often we see that. Well, I can't do what God wants me to do because of this person. Because this person is a hindrance to me. And this situation is a hindrance. And you know, a lot of people leave churches because they think that, that the battle is with somebody else in the church. Oh, yeah. That's simply not true. Sure. The battle is with Satan. And they had a loss of vision of what it was God wanted them to do. But, but most notably here, they had a loss of faith because they said, we are not able. They began to do the good work. They had strengthened their hands. They had a mind to work. They built the walls of half as high. And then halfway through, they wanted to quit. That's exactly the way it is. And you've heard me say it before. That halfway through is the toughest thing of anything. That halfway through. Uh, when you're halfway there, that's when you most want to quit. That's when it calls for perseverance. And it calls for endurance. And that's one of the things I pray for every day for myself. Is I pray that God will fill me with His Holy Spirit that will give me endurance and patience and wisdom. And so we cannot lose our faith because we begin to feel discouraged and not able. Here's a good way of just summarizing that. The enemy said, you won't do it. Judah said, we can't do it. But Nehemiah said, God will do it. Because look what happens uh, in his response here. 
I want to talk for a moment. That's the opposition. I want to talk about the uh, overcoming response uh, that they exhibit. First of all, we see in verses 4, 5, and 9, and on through this passage, that Nehemiah continued to respond in prayer. That's our first line of defense. Every time Satan comes against us, prayer should be what we do first. So often, don't, don't we open our mouth and we say what we think, and then we realize that we need to pray? But prayer should always be our first line of defense. And he kept going back to God over and over and over. You see this through the entire book. That no matter what happened, Nehemiah kept going to God. And that's where our strength is. That's where our response should always be. We should return to prayer. Well then, uh, the people not only returned to prayer, but he instilled them a resolve to fight. Look at it in verses 13 through 15. Uh, let's see, I, I think we've got 13 and 14 on there. Okay, let's read that. Please. Therefore, I position men uh, behind the lower parts of the wall. At the opening, <coughs> and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and I rose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest, do not be afraid of them. And so he called on them to have a resolve. Friend, I want you to know the Christian life is not for wimps. It, it takes a man of God to stand up and do the right thing. It takes a woman of God who is plugged into the power source to know uh, that you've got to fight for what's important. Moms, we've got to fight for our children. We've got to fight for our communities. We've got to fight for our schools. I don't mean we take up arms and, and come against everything with, with this spirit of, of militantism. That's what the world does. They're militant in so many things. But, but then we come against them with a resolve. And when the deadline comes, we say, no, we're not going any further. We cannot compromise on this. This, it should not be. And we are standing for right. And God in this world. And so they resolved to fight. And then uh, we see that they reorganized for success. Let me pull my glasses out because I want to read verses 16 through 18 to you. They reorganized for success. Well, let me read verse 15. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God has brought their plot to nothing, you remember their conspiracy, that all of us return to the wall and everyone to his work. So there's the resolve. Verse 16, And so it was from that time on that half of my servants work at construction while the other half held spears and shields and bows uh, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind uh, all the house of Judah. And so we see a togetherness. We see that they were uh, organizing, organizing differently in order to accomplish the work. And sometimes we have to make adjustments midstream. We don't always know what we're going to encounter. And you know what? Things, life is made of adjustments. Somebody said that flexibility is the key to life. And I want you to know that's true. That's not only true physically for you, but it's true spiritually. You've got to be flexible because God knows what's ahead and you don't. And then verse 17 goes, goes on and he says, Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens and loaded themselves so that one hand, with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held the weapon. And every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet, he said, was beside him. So he reorganized them for success, and then finally, he uh, rallied for support. We see that in the remaining portion of the chapter. He says, Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive. He said, we're, we're, we're separated too far. We're working too independently from one another. Verse 20, he says, Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, and our God will fight for us. What he's saying is, 
when one brother gets in trouble, all the other brothers should be there to help him. He said, listen for the sound of the trumpet. Listen for the cry that you need to come and support your brethren. You know what? This is how we overcome the enemy's attacks in our church and in our lives individually is that we return to prayer, we resolve to fight, we reorganize for success, and we rally to support one another. You see, Nehemiah and the people of God were mocked, they were ridiculed, they were threatened, they were despised, they were conspired against, but they kept on building. Why? Because they understood what I shared with you earlier, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. That we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That we can indeed do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That he is uh, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You see, they kept their faith in God. They had to make some adjustments. But you know, I, I, I'm convinced that this is the way it is with a lot of God's people. Their faith is in God. But because they failed to go back and make the adjustments, Return to prayer every time they encounter a problem. Resolve to fight. Draw a line in the sand. This is, I'm not giving up here. There's some marriages that need to resolve to fight for the marriage. Uh, reorganize for success and rally together for support. That's what worship ought to be when we come on Sunday mornings and when we go to connection class and when we go on Wednesday nights. It should be a rally for support because we are not alone in this life. We have the Lord. He has given us His people to be with us. So I want to ask you today, how would you respond to the enemy's attack? Do you respond in prayer? Do you respond with resolve? Do you reorganize when necessary? Are you willing to back up and make those adjustments. You see, that's where a lot of churches fail because they never adjust their ministries. Times change. People change. The Word of God never changes. But the method and the things we do must change. And then we rally together 